the parent now of children in their 20s, I've discovered that they never grow out of it. <laughs> they just ask for more, more expensive things. Well, Jesus encourages here to adopt the attitude of children to their Father in heaven, and so to believe that God will answer this prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not not into into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and and the glory, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks, Mark. Please be seated. Thank you. Okay, good evening everybody, uh, welcome to tonight's full council meeting and the following extraordinary meeting. Um, if I can go straight on to the agenda and item number one is the evacuation procedure. We're, <coughs> we're not expecting the fire alarms to go off so if they do we'll treat them for real and if we can evacuate the, this room from either side, down the stairs at the front, please don't use the lifts, and we'll meet across the road at the Yorkshire Bank. If anybody needs any assistance, uh, then please let us know, we'll make sure that assistance is given. It's also uh, a good time to remind people to make sure your phones are turned off or set to silent. And just to remind people that Uh, Pretty much all of our meetings, as this one, are recorded now and certainly from the council's recordings they go out onto YouTube uh, within a couple of days of of the meeting. So item number two, to receive apologies for absence. Uh, Thank you Mr Mayor, I've received apologies from Councillor Bennett. Okay, thank you. And just a reminder there, particularly for members, is to turn your microphones on before you speak and turn them off when you've you've finished because if you don't, it will stop somebody else from using theirs. And there's also a roving mic available for members of the public when they speak. Item number four is to confirm... Sorry... Councillor Copeland? Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I beg your pardon. Um, I rise because I'm a bit concerned about the minutes from last meeting. Because if we turn to page 8 and CL18, censure of a member. Now, if you read all that, it talks not and doesn't give a member's name there. It talks about a complaint against you, and it uses the word you quite often in it. Now, obviously, a member's been censured for a reason, and the minutes are kept for a reason. And actually, it tells you the last sentence is, this censure will be minuted and kept on public record indefinitely, so that anybody in future years or weeks, or whenever, could actually look at this and think, but this doesn't make clear who received the censure. Now, it may well be, in years to come, somebody, public, sees it and thinks, oh, it was a councillor for, oh, he was a Green Party councillor. Oh, he was the member for Weddington. Oh, maybe it was that Councillor Bonner fellow. (laughs) <laughs> well there we go now I personally don't think that's fair now it may well be that they think differently to that and think of any member sitting over there 
or indeed this side. So I'm really concerned that we give the council or however, whoever's actually giving the censure is just giving a censure that's recorded, well, yeah. could, it be, could be you, Councillor Wilson, could be, dare I say it, me, I do nothing wrong. But, sure, that's my point. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about that, that the member is not mentioned by name, and I don't think that's right. Thank you, Councillor. So you're, you're, you're moving an, an amendment to the, well, to, to correct the minutes. Certainly my recollection is uh, that the member was directed for confirmation and that, and if so, then we'll amend the minutes accordingly. Um, yes, Mr Mayor, that councillor was named, and it's Councillor Condarka. Thank you. Well, it's, it's not a matter for debate, it's just about the accuracy of the minutes. I wish to talk about the accuracy of the minutes. No. Councillor Condacor. Councillor Condacor, it's not a game. We're amending the minutes to include your name. I would also like the minutes amended to reflect the fact I asked to speak after I was sanctioned to put my version of events. You, you didn't have and a... And I was refused permission to Councillor speak. Councillor Condacor. And if we Councillor are Condacor, changing... don't start the meeting off as you mean to go on, please. You had no right... Of response I have no to right. it. No. At that censure, you had no right of reply. Thank you. Don't blame me, blame the Constitution. Change that. Councillor Condacourt, I'm not going to keep asking you to be quiet tonight. Is that okay? You understand. Keep nodding, yeah? You, keep, you understand. I'm not in North Korea. Keep. Oh. <laughs> Item. Number five is declarations of interest. Try ones. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, declare an interest by way of being a deputy police and crime commissioner for Warwickshire. Thank you. Already recorded. No, thank you. <coughs> Item number six is to receive announcements from the mayor, leader, members of the cabinet. Um, If I can just, I've got a, a few things, if you could bear with me, please. Um, I just wanted to mention, everybody will be aware of the visit from our twin town of Rowan recently. Small delegation visited us. I had the pleasure as, uh, as mayor to welcome them and also to um, uh, uh, give them a visit around the neat and also into Bedworth. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that... the. There's definite, still definite advantages to our twinning arrangements, particularly in the areas of education and, and business links. And displayed on the table in the well of the chamber, uh, to your left, to my right, the picture that Rowan donated to us uh, on, on this occasion. The, I've lost my bit of paper now. Um, again, we... Last week saw the very first 10k road race in, uh, in Nuneaton, uh, which I attended. I've seen them off from here and then helped present the, the medals, of which I've forgotten to put on, which I meant to. Um, and the feedback we certainly got from the competitors was really good. They really enjoyed <coughs> it, uh, said it was a good route, and uh, they're really keen on coming back next year to do it again, and hopefully we'll have a lot more people although there was probably, there was over 200 runners in it, which I thought was really good for the very first race. Um, and just a few cheeky things, just to say, uh, we're doing a, a fundraising quiz night on October the 3rd in Bedworth. Uh, uh, it's £10 per teams of four, so anybody that's interested in that, please give us a, a, a shout for that. Um, Mark's kindly allowed me to, to take part in the harvest celebrations at Bedworth Baptist Church. So I'm making that my civic service, which is on Sunday, October the 8th, as well as, uh, you know, the chain gang, as we call them. I would hope that some members would also like to come along to that. It's at 10.45 on October the 8th at Bedworth Baptist Church. And just my last one for now... Um, Again, I've been cheeky. I'm sending around a sponsorship form for, for people tonight. Um, and it's, I've offered myself to do a wing walk on October the 11th. So 
providing the weather's okay, I'll be standing on top of a plane, uh, an airfield in uh, Sirencester, doing about 160 mile an hour uh, and wherever they want to take me. So it's something different. I hope people can support me. Um, there's quite a few already. So thank you. We're looking for as many sponsors as we can get. I say we because my, one of my daughters is doing it as well, in her pyjamas apparently. But, yeah. um, okay, so... That's, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. I've got that many bits of paper, bear with me please. Um, I also have the following uh, announcement. The leader of the council has received on behalf of the authority the Best Small Business Friendly Procurement or Regulation Policy Award for the Council's Think Local First Procurement Policy. The Council's Think Local First Procurement Policy is a new scheme to enhance SMEs' <coughs> excuse me, access to bid for procurement opportunities within the Borough Council. Furthermore, Think Local First is driving a concerted effort to make businesses within the borough recognise the benefits that local supply chains have on local businesses within the borough. Considering that last year Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council spent £22 million on goods and services, it was noted that only around 10% was spent with businesses within the borough. In order to change this, a simple scheme has been devised to ensure that local businesses are offered opportunities and to aid in the delivery of Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council's <coughs> economic growth ambitions. Staff at Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council have been encouraged through active internal marketing and presentations to think local first when going out to the market to procure goods and services for the borough. Our procurement toolkit has been updated in order to ensure that colleagues recognise the importance of thinking local first. By using the flexibility built into our contract procedure rules, there is a potential for over £6.5 million worth of contract opportunities to be available to local SMEs. By encouraging local SMEs to submit quotes, we hope to increase our local spend up to as much as 28%. This will have an enormous effect on not only the supply chains of the borough, but also the local services that these employees will then use. The Borough Council has also actively promoted Think Local First to the wider economy and with its strategic partners at the Growth Hub has ensured that businesses within the borough are aware of the policy. OK, thank you. Do you have any announcements other than that, Alan? Um, my announcements uh, refer to uh, the centre of a member on uh, agenda item 7. OK. So if there are no more announcements from yourself, yeah. Mr Mayor. Anything from the leader? No. OK, thank you. Councillor Condor You can appeal. I've not been allowed to see the censure before it's being read out, and therefore I'm not able to correct any errors within the censure. Councillor Condacor, we have this. And this goes Con against my human rights. Councillor Condacor. Item number seven, managing director to censure a member. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, this is a censure in relation to Councillor Keith Condacor which clearly is going to be heard, um, the results of that censure this evening. The background to the censure is that on the 16th of August 2017, the Standards Local Hearing Panel was established to hold a hearing into a complaint against you, Councillor Kondaka, that you had failed to comply with the following paragraphs of the Council's Code of Conduct, which state, paragraph 3A, you must treat others with respect, Paragraph 3B2, you not, must not bully any person. Paragraph 3B3, you must not intimidate or attempt to intimidate any person who is likely to be involved in the administration of any investigation or proceedings. And paragraph 5, you must, you must not conduct yourself in a manner which could reasonably re be regarded as bringing your office or authority into disrepute. The circumstances giving rise to the complaint were as follows. On the 13th of April 2016, you had posted the following comments on the Nuneaton Community Forum Facebook page. 
These are the comments. The Borough Council is institutionally dishonest. On the radio today, the Council Director interviewed, misled people on the 20% hike in all daytime parking charges of over one hour. The Council Director said the car park charges were increased by a small amount in the last budget for people staying between one and two hours. The Council Directors are well paid, and this one has done a flexible retirement deal to get pension topped so he can work four days a week. This cost around 50k. Those were your comments. Secondly, on the 5th of May 2016, you had responded by email to an email from the same officer in relation to his, his findings of an investigation he had carried out into concerns over a, a report to planning committee about the felling of oak trees for the development off Weddington Road, in which you had stated... Just to be clear, I do not accept the outcome of your so-called investigation and request that no planning permission be issued until this matter is sorted. If this note is ignored, then I will take action against you and the Council. The Standards Local Hearing Panel decision was that you also found that you had breached paragraphs 3A, 3B2, 3B3 and paragraph 5 of the Code of Conduct for Councillors. The sanction is as follows. The breach was considered to be significant and the local hearing panel felt that you'd be publicly censured at this full council meeting and as part of the censure, the panel agreed that your access to officers and their officers be restricted uh, and that all contact with officers is made via Kelly Baxter or Philip Richardson. The panel also resolved for its findings in respect of your conduct to be published by way of a press release, for you to make a public apology on the Nuneaton Community Forum Facebook page, confirming that your posts were not true and without facts, that the details of your actions, its findings and the outcome be included in the letter to be sent to the Green Party as part of the sanctions imposed at the hearing on the 11th of April 2017. The reasons for imposing the sanction was that the panel found that the statement made by you on the community, Nuneaton Community Forum Facebook page was false, and in making it, you not only failed to have regard for the facts, but also the implications of this on the council or the officer. It was an irresponsible and malicious attack on the integrity of the officer and an attempt to undermine the officer, which on a balance amounted to bullying. The email you sent to the officer on the 5th of May 2017 threatening uh, action against them was a further attempt to intimidate the officer and your inference that it was election day was not justification for such a threat. Furthermore, public ma publicly making the assertions that the Borough Council is institutionally dishonest was a clear attempt to undermine public confidence in the organisation and shows blatant disrespect to all members and officers who are part of it. I am therefore formally censuring you for your actions, and this censure will be minuted and kept on public record indefinitely. OK, thank you. You have no right of reply, Councillor. Which takes us on to item 8, which is public participation to hear and answer questions by any resident of the borough concerning the work of the council where the notice has been given. We've had notice of, of four questions and due to the amount of business we have tonight, I don't intend to take any supplementaries from either the members of the public or council members' questions tonight. Um, could I ask Kyle Evans to ask his question? Thank you, Mr Mayor. A few weeks ago, I attended the Borough Plan examination hearings alongside many other members of the public who were also outraged by the way the Borough Plan consultation has been driven by this council. I was astonished to find out that the council had hired a barrister to defend the council's flawed Borough Plan, despite the council having its own legal officers. Like many other residents, I feel angered that the council have decided to waste taxpayers' money in this way. So firstly, I would like to ask the Cabinet Member why the Council needed to hire a barrister to defend the plan when the Council has their own legal team. Secondly, could I ask how much money it has cost the Council and the local taxpayers to hire this barrister? 
Thirdly, does the Cabinet member agree that the money wasted on a barrister should have instead been spent on delivering a better consultation process, which was seriously inadequate? And finally, will the Cabinet member do the honourable thing and make a public apology to the people of this borough for the shambles they experienced during the borough plan consultation? Thank you. Councillor Aldington, you wish to reply? Examination hearings are a very important step in the local plan process. The first stage of these was, as Mr Evans has already said, at the end of August. This stage was for the inspector con to consider whether the plan meets the legal tests as set out in the planning legislation and guidance. These tests have to be met before the examination can continue. It was considered that as this was a legal test, then the borough would be best represented by someone who had expertise of other similar local plan hearings. The cost of the barrister for the work undertaken before and during the hearings has totaled £19,140, including VAT. I do not think... Carry on, Cash. I do not think that this has been wasted money. Could I ask Michelle Condico to ask her question, please? Thank you. On the 23rd of August, the Council published its 2017 Nuneaton and Bedworth Air Quality Annual Status Report. This is based on the 2016 air quality measurements from diffusion tubes and the highly accurate automatic monitoring station. The legal limit for nitrous dioxide pollution is an annual mean value of 40 micrograms per square metre. However, there is a significant health impact well below this level. It is estimated that around 64 people are dying earlier than they would otherwise do so each year in the borough with our current level of pollution. The figures show that nitrous dioxide pollution at the automatic monitoring station rose from 32.4 to 36.2 micrograms per, square me uh, per cubic metre in 2016. That is a significant 12% increase compared to 2015. The Council is allowing thousands more homes to be built north of Nuneaton over the next decade, and we have two new supermarkets opening this year nearby. It is expected that traffic around the gyratory could increase by up to 50%. The Council has discontinued the use of the automatic monitoring station just when traffic levels are expected to rise sharply. It has also significantly stopped regular monitoring of curbside emissions on Hinkley Road. At one location at the old Hinkley Road curbside, the concentration of nitrous dioxide is often between 60 and 70 micrograms per cubic metre over a month. Things are even worse at Corporation Street stroke Mid Midland Road. The monitoring shows levels above the legal limit of nitrous dioxide still persist at some locations. Sites NB27, NB29 and NB30 have annual averages of 40 or above. My husband has obtained raw diffusion tube data for the first half of 2017 using the Freedom of Information Act. This data shows a considerable increase over the same raw data for 2016. Without our council's automatic monitoring station, it is not easy to establish how real this increase is. Why is it that the council is continuing to mothball the automatic monitoring station and refusing to monitor curbside nitrous dioxide pollution directly, given the worrying trends? Thank you. Councillor Longdon? Uh, I think this is along the lines of four, <coughs> four of the questions within the last 12 months on the same subject. The Council monitors and reports on air quality in a way that fully meets the requirements of a national air quality strategy. It's a fully compliant monitoring programme and keeps us under review and ensures it's fit for purpose. We do not monitor short-term curb, curbside nitrogen dioxide concentrations because it does not exceed the air quality objective. A nationally recognised suitable alternative is now available to achieve the purpose of the automatic monitoring station, so there is no longer a need to sustain the cost of £5,000 per year to run it. There are no worrying trends of air quality in this borough. The only area that monitoring and assessment has ever identified as being of concern is long-term nitrogen dioxide concentrations at the front of people's homes. In 2008, there were exceedances at, a, at several locations at levels up to 25% higher than the air quality objective. In 2016, there was only one exceedance at the location on Midland Road at a level of 10% above the air quality objective. In fact, this is such an improvement 
that DEFRA, the Government Department Overseas National Air Quality Strategy, has recommended that we revoke the air quality management area at Leicester Road gyratory system because it is no, now no longer since, sorry, now so long since there's any exceedance of the air quality objective in that area. Furthermore, the analysis we have done to assess the effects on air quality of the, of the borough plan found that by the end of the plan period, there will no longer be any exceedances of air quality objectives anywhere in the borough. These positive trends are identified through analysis by independent experts using the prescribed scientific methods. As an addendum to that, Mr Chairman, I am somewhat, I've said it before, I'm somewhat concerned uh, about the tone of some of the questions and some of the information within it. The figure of 64, 000, 64 people dying earlier is based on a national figure uh, across the country of people dying prematurely. It's then divided by a number of areas and you end up with this one at 64. There is no direct evidence that 64 people in this borough have died as a direct result of the air quality within the borough. In fact, a lot of people have pre-existing conditions, like myself, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease, COPD, and around the borough we know we have health, health inequalities uh, with uh, lung and heart disease. Uh, so, whilst this may be a contributory factor, can I stress that these people do not die as a direct result of air quality within this borough? And I, I think I need to make that clear because these, these, these figures are going out publicly and I want to th well, throw that to myth to the, to the wolves. Because, so, so, Mrs. So, Mrs. Condacore, please have the respect of the people. <coughs> I'll just Mrs. Condor, Mrs. <coughs> Mrs. Mrs. Condacore. Well, can I suggest, Chair, that uh, the questioner, uh, as well as questioning this council on these things, actually gets hold of DEFRA. If she doesn't believe what we're saying here, she's fully, she can fully, fully told to go to DEFRA and find out what they say. Thank you. Owen Reid to ask his question, please. Thank you. Uh, Recently, I've been talking to local market traders and local residents in Bedworth. Now, as you can see, Bedworth Market is in complete decline under this Labour-led council. The market needs a breath of fresh air. I think the best way we can combat the decline of Bedworth Market is to bring it back into the town centre, maybe in the town centre in the summer months and in the winter months in the market space. This would also give us the opportunity to use the market space for other events, such as Christmas fairs and Easter events. It also needs some urgent care in terms of cleanliness and with its appeal. This is a third-rate market, and will you please listen to the residents of Bedworth and please give us a say on how, it can, how we can make a once-loved market loved again. Councillor Harvey. You wish to speak for all the residents of Nuneaton or Bedworth or both. Uh, that's what democracy is about. We speak for a section of residents. But... Uh, Bedworth Market has not been in the street for over 50 years. Before it was in the covered area it is in now, it was on the same spot with metal rows of stalls. It was only temporarily moved out while the new market was being built. So first of all, that's one fact about Bedworth Market. <coughs> Secondly, Mr Mayor, unless Mr Reid is talking about some other market in Bedworth, he may be unaware that every one of the permanent units in the market is let. Indeed, we have a waiting list. How are these people supposed to go in and out of the market on a six-monthly basis, as he suggests? They do not want outdoor stores. Many towns have lost their markets altogether. We have not. However, we are aware that Bedworth Market is in need of some changes and updating and intend to instigate a high-level internal cleaner, install pigeon proofing, update exterior graphics, paint the exterior, install Wi-Fi and football, football counters for a start. In addition, we are looking at how the existing static stalls could be altered, with some <coughs> pop-up stalls as used in Nuneaton being made available. Bedworth Market still has one of the cheapest stall rents in Britain. I am sure no traders would thank us 
If we were to take the stalls outside, with all the extra costs involved in erecting and dismantling stalls being added to their rent, making it totally unviable. Furthermore, Mr Mayor, Bedworth Market is not affected when we have high winds, as we had in Nuneaton today, and traders are certainty all year round for a price that is second to none, just over £8 for a single stall. Thank you. <coughs> Could I ask Barry Goss to ask his question, please? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, my question or my comments about the borough plan... I attended all three days of the inspector's hearing, which was extremely informative, and it's a well-managed process. If there are any doubts, it demonstrated just how challenging it is to formulate a robust borough plan and deal with the many complexities that arise. It's a pity that more councillors were not present to educate themselves on the key issues. First of all, I have to congratulate those council officers that were directly involved in the hearing, who had to front up to a barrage of questions, not just from the inspector, but those raised by the many legal experts who represented building developers and other clients. Also, this was against a background where key council staff had recently left and there was constant confusion over housing numbers all three days. And this wasn't helped by the fact that the housing numbers report for 2015 and 16 had not been completed due to a shortage of planning staff. Moreover, and what is a real travesty, is that valuable input or direction from elected councillors have been largely precluded due to the council leader and his cabinet operating in a complete vacuum, totally regardless of the views of others. Common themes emerged over the three days. Lack of transparency, opaque decisions, poor process compliance, political bias, and little or no evidence to justify key decisions. All familiar traits to those who have followed the Gresham Road Depot debacle and the cuts made to the sheltered housing service. Now this borough plan, it must be the most important piece of work this council has or will ever have on its plate. It will shape the future of the borough for years to come for the benefit of our children and grandchildren. It's a wonderful opportunity to embrace change, to engage and re-energise communities develop town centres even, build affordable housing and attract new employment opportunities to the area. It really is that exciting. Well, it could be, but unfortunately, this council leadership has managed to take it in the opposite direction, ignoring residents, marginalising communities, planning few affordable dwellings and offering nothing on the employment front other than constant flag-waving and initiatives. This course was set early on, when this council leadership critically failed to oversee the timely issue of the in-touch publication to advise its residents of the, constitutional, of the consultation plans, thus demonstrating just how little they cared from the onset. My question is, what lessons have the council leader and his cabinet learnt from the hearing and what are they going to do differently moving forward? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harvey? Right from the beginning, we did have a lack of council involvement and that is we had no one from the opposition willing to take part in the Borough Plan Working Party. Uh, uh, just, just, yeah. Councillor Harvey, just give me one moment, please. This is a question and answer section, which members should be aware of. If they're not, please read up on your constitution. I have other people calling out. I don't intend the meeting to be disrespectful to people. Councillor Harvey. People who know our planning policies will know that, in fact, we have, in fact, taken great account of affordable housing and insist upon our developments, including affordable housing. And I'm pleased to say that I was invited by Midland Heart Housing Association to a, a, a dwelling they had just taken charge of in Weddington, in a very nice development which was a credit to this borough, as you enter this borough, and where the, it was half ownership, half rent, that they in fact had 31 dwellings on the particular site they were on, and they were taking more on other sites. So I'm quite pleased with our policies, giving far more affordable housing. 
In answer regarding the borough plan, Mr Mayor, I think it's quite inappropriate to comment about this because the borough plan is now with the inspector to make his comments, and it is a man, and decisions, and so any lessons that we may or may not need to take will necessarily have to await the inspector's thoughts. Takes us on to the list of questions we have by members, and we've had notice of 12 questions from members. Can I ask Councillor Caroline Phillips to ask hers, please? George Osborne's local government finance bill was dropped in the run-up to the general election and has not been resurrected. The bill would have enabled councils to retain 100% of business rates to make up for the loss of revenue grants. The Fair Funding Review, which would have ensured a fair distribution of wealth across richer and poorer areas, has also been dumped. Does the Leader agree that councils are now in a state of financial limbo? Um, Councillor Harvey, is it you? move to 100% business rates retention was intended to be implemented by 2020. The Local Government Finance Bill did not make sufficient progress before the general election and was not reintroduced in the Queen's speech. In fact, George Osborne had also been done to that point. There are some elements of the scheme that could be implemented without primary legislation, but this is unclear. The Government has recently published a prospectus for further pilots of 100% business rates retention pools having refused to allow us to belong to the new West Midlands pool. But the deadline for submission is the 27th of October. Further clarification has been sought on some aspects of the scheme from DCLG, as the prospectus is unclear and the timetables time for making an application are very tight. Warwickshire uh, 151 officers met today to discuss the benefits of submitting an application to be a pilot pool from April 2018, and there do seem to be advantages in it. It's understood that the fair funding review is still progressing, but there is no further information on timescales or implications. The particular concern for us is that the council is into negative rate support grant in 2019-20, which actually means, Mr Mayor, that the residents of this borough will have to give the government money instead of the other way around. Without the prospect of 100% business rates retention to ease the impact, this brings great uncertainty into our financial planning. And based on current assumptions, <coughs> the council requires savings of around 1.7 million over the next two years, on top of what we've already saved to balance the budget. Uh, could I ask Councillor Glass to ask his question? Thank you. I stand on his representation at the combined authority, and in particular anything that might be a benefit to Nuneaton and Bedworth. I can tell Councillor Glass that our membership, as a non-constituent member of the West Midlands Combined Authority, has been a great success. We were the very first authority to apply for and be accepted as a non-constituent member to join the cities of the region, despite the opposition of the Conservative and Green councillors in this council. I was appointed as an early stage as the representative of all the non-constituent councils on the Strategic Economic Plan Committee for the region, and this was reconfirmed this year. This gives us an insight into what is being put forward at an early stage and has enabled me to speak up for Nuneaton and Bedworth. Most of the other councils in Warwickshire have now followed us into membership of the Combined Authority, including the County Council, who vehemently opposed our membership from the start. Our membership is beginning to bear fruit, Mr Mayor. The new West Midlands trains, which will replace London Midland in this area, will be expanding their services with a twice-hourly service to Leamington via Coventry, running every 20 minutes on Saturday. This will mean that people in the south of the county will more easily be able to come to our markets and town centres and job opportunities will be widened. We are campaigning at the same time to get the government, and we're supported in this by the cities, to 
to allow transport advantages in, enjoyed, for instance, by Coventry residents to be expanded to Nuneaton and Bedworth. We have also been picked out to receive funds, possibly of several hundred thousand pounds, towards programmes helping people to get back into work in this borough, and we have put forward land development schemes for funding by the <coughs> West Midlands. In short, our decision to become members was the right one, and our membership fee looks likely to bring in financial rewards to our borough, which far outweigh our outgoings. I ask Councillor Daffern to ask her a question, please. Earlier, holder for planning and development, tell the council how many affordable housing properties have been made available over the last 12 months. Is he able to give any details on where these are situated within the borough? Could I ask Councillor Gobi to ask her a question, please? A recent news update on the George Elliott Hospital website has appeared telling everyone the following. Exciting new improvements to A&E have started to improve access to A&E and urgent care for all our local community and to enlarge existing facilities. George Elliott Hospital welcomes the investment earlier this year from the Department of Health to ease the pressure for winter 2017-18. The improvement creates a one-stop shop emergency department, accessed through one front door that incorporates A&E, out-of-hours GP services, urgent care and the minor injury service. Urgent care and out-of-hours service will be located together in the new extended A&E and the minor in injuries unit will be enlarged to better support our patients. This improvement to our existing services aims to increase capacity improve waiting areas, decrease waiting times for our patients. The George Elliott have, in fact, received £1 million worth of funding which has facilitated the expansion of services, with the overall aim being, being to help meet the 95% standard for admitting, transferring or discharging patients within four hours by ensuring patients are treated with the most appropriate setting. In other words, consolidating and reconfiguring services to provide a better outcome for the patient. A meeting at Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council was held in this town hall, Nuneaton, Wednesday the 7th of December 2016. A statement was made on the STP by the portfolio holder. In reference to A&E at the George Elliot, he said, I'm quoting from the minutes, just so there's no element of doubt. It also says in the STP, A&E reconfiguration what does that mean and consolidation? What does reconfiguration and consolidation mean? It means we are likely to have what is known as an urgent and emergency care centre, not an A&E. Therefore, it will not be funded on the same basis and neither it will it serve the same process. The consequences of this, we are likely to lose the intensive care unit. So it brings up a few questions as to what are the consequences for doing some of these things. Following from this, and despite the absence of any evidence, and even with the George Elliott Hospital themselves issuing a statement, uh, issuing a letter to staff giving categoric assurances that there were no plans to close A&E, which I quoted myself in this chamber, members of this council persisted with public claims that A&E was under threat of downgrade or complete closure. Will the portfolio holder and or the leader now confirm they understand that consolidation and reconfiguration of A&E services does not mean closure or downgrade of A&E or a loss of ITU and it was incorrect to assume that this would be the outcome of any change at the George Elliott A&E? Yeah. Mr Mayor, this is not the question submitted by Councillor Golby before... Did I finish Mr Mayor? Carry on, Councillor Harvey. This is not the question submitted by Councillor Golby before 12 noon yesterday in line with the Constitution. Please. No. That question was no. rejected and I was given special just read out. Councillor Golby, can I, I know it's difficult for some members, but please, we're not going to have the shouting out across the chamber. If you wish to speak, indicate, and it will be me that decides whether I allow you to speak or not. 
If I don't and you're not happy, then follow the correct procedure and take me to task. But I didn't see any need for that, Councillor Gorby. Councillor Harvey, if you'd like to carry on. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll start again. This is not the question submitted by Councillor Gorby before 12 noon yesterday in line with the Constitution. Her question was centred around Labour Party activity in our borough to save services at the George Elliot. Perhaps she might acknowledge that the Labour Party activity forced to rethink if that is what has happened. I am not convinced, however, Mr Mayor, that all services at George Elliot are as safe as Councillor Gorby claims. However, has she as today changed her question with no direct copy to me as laid down by the Constitution? I am not going to follow through on this. The rule is quite clear, Mr Mayor. Sending a question before 12 noon to the managing director with copies to the leader and the member's services officer. Make sure that question is fundamentally about the work of the council or other matters of importance to the borough and not directly about people of opposing political views, many of whom are not councillors and for whom I cannot speak. Mr Mayor, the, pay, the question is not before us, but the question has been seen by everybody concerned who sees the questions. That was not the question Councillor Golby submitted before 12pm yesterday, and I believe very strongly, Mr Mayor, we have rules, and everybody should abide by those rules. Which takes us on to question five. Could I ask Councillor Wilson to ask his question, please? Mrs. in the Neaton Town Centre have voted decisively in favour of bringing forward a business improvement district for the town, something which we on the oppos Conservative opposition have called for and wholeheartedly support. Will the Leader of the Council now commit to joining the Conservatives in supporting a bid for Neaton and make it formal Council policy to actively endorse and set up a bid with the businesses, the businesses in Neaton and also commit to doing the same should the businesses in Bedworth also wish to pursue a business improvement district. Thank you. Has offered its support to the steering group looking to the development of a business improvement district within Neaton Town Centre. The Borough Council has provided some funding jointly with the County Council to allow for a feasibility study to be con conducted by the Association of Town Centre Managers on behalf of the steering group. The bid steering group is in the process of applying to British bids for a loan from the bid loan fund, funded by the Department of Communities and Local Government, to assist with the development of new bids in town and city centres. This authority has provided a letter of support to the steering group as part of their application. Jonathan White, our Head of Town Centres and Marketing, who is an experienced bid manager from elsewhere, <coughs> provides ongoing support to the steering group and attends their meetings. The Council as well, Mr Mayor, would consider any request for support should Bedworth businesses wish to also pursue a bid. OK, thank you. Uh, question six, Councillor... Trumans, if you could ask yours. Uh, and as uh, someone who started a small business in Dunedin, may I thank you also for your notice uh, about the award to the council uh, and commend officers for the good work they did in the local procurement policy. Thank you. Um, my question is, in view of the criticisms made by QCs and others uh, at the recent planning inspectors' hearings, can the leader confirm that he, the portfolio holder, and indeed the whole cabinet, still fully back their borough plan? Thank you. Councillor Hart.
Thanks. It's on to item num question number seven. Councillor Good. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Good luck with the wing walk. I'd need a larger aeroplane. <laughs> My question is for the portfolio holder for central services. The Council has recently taken a decision by office, officers under delegated powers, hidden away from public scrutiny, to lease land at the back of Travis Perkins to park vehicles overnight, there instead of the depot. Are there any additional insurance costs for parking the vehicles overnight, not on council premises? And will this new arrangement complicate any further tendering exercise for council services when Travis Perkins are, apart, are, are apparently giving us a freebie? Furthermore, could the portfolio holder explain what consideration was given to the extra vehicle movements this will cause in the nearby, nearby area for the local residents. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in accordance with its agreed scheme of delegations and decision-making process, which are amongst the most open and transparent in the country, officers have made a decision to take advantage of an offer from Travis Perkins to use spare land at the rear of their premises to park Borough Council housing and maintenance vehicles at no cost to the Borough Council. There are no insurance issues associated with our vehicles being parked at this location. The agreement to use this area of Travis Perkins site is time limited to the length of the current material supply contract and will have no bearing whatsoever on the requirements that will be incorporated in the procurement process for the supply of building materials after the current agreement comes to an end. Having said that, Organisations tendering for Borough Council contracts are free to advise of any additional benefits they might be able to offer the Borough Council over and above what a contract specification requires as part of their submissions. Consideration of any such additional benefits would not form part of the standard tender evaluation process, though. As stated, the vehicles that will be parked at the Travis Perkins site are housing maintenance vehicles and so would be visiting the Travis Perkins site during their no normal working, in any case, to pick up materials. Hence, there will be no additional vehicle movements. Mr Mayor, further to the implication in the question of lack of openness, I gave an answer at full council, that's here, on the 26th of April, in reply to a member question which mentioned the Travis Perkins arrangement. The question to be put as the legal notice about overnight parking at Gresham Road had just appeared in the press, and the questioner wanted to know if there would be enough space at the facility should grounds maintenance vehicles also need to be parked. I said in this chamber, with everyone here, hardly away from public scrutiny, that, additionally, we are making arrangements with our building maintenance materials supplier for secure parking facilities to be made available as part of the overall service they offer. Nobody objected then nor since, Mr Mayor. Members will not need reminding that 18 weeks is a very long time in politics. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brindley, if you'd like to ask your question. So couldn't even manage to distribute the InTouch magazine to coincide with a consultation on the magnitude of the borough plan, will the portfolio holder now accept that it is not worth the money and scrap it, or alternatively move to a much more cost-effective online version? Thank you. Councillor? Uh, the Council's InTouch magazine is an important communication tool as a means of reaching all borough households. Well... The magazine is available online too. The hard copy format is preferred by many residents and we are mindful of the need to provide information in a variety of ways to reach different audiences. The vast majority of our residents, the vast majority, do not automatically connect to the council online. It's something you have to take a positive action to do. It doesn't just appear in your house online. Scrapping in touch would lead to the overwhelming majority of our residents, many of them elderly, being left with no direct communication about council or community events in this borough. 
It would be totally discriminatory in its effect, and we shall not be doing it. Take us on to question nine. Councillor Smith. Uh, as we build an increasing amount of houses, uh, and regardless of the borough plan, the residents of Bulkington and wider areas are already finding it increasingly difficult to secure the school places they want for their children and register families with local doctors. Can the portfolio holder for planning and development confirm what work has been done to turn the infrastructural wish list contained in the borough plan into a detailed action plan that will deliver more school places and doctor surgeries before filling new housing with yet more residents. Can he also confirm if he's looked at the impact of the proposed increase of housing on the HSG1 site, on the residents of Bulkington and surrounding areas, which will increase the pressure on already stretched essential services? What does he intend to do to reassure Bulkington residents that this council cares enough about them to provide adequate plans for increased infrastructure before populating new houses in the surrounding areas? If, the, if this work has been done, when and where will it be published? Thank you. And under way or with planning permission, have Section 106 legal agreements attached to them. These include the developers making contributions towards the following infrastructure, highways improvements, education provision, including new schools, community facilities, health facilities, including doctors, libraries, play and open space, footpaths and cycleways. Some of these monies have already been received and passed to the relevant delivery bodies. As Councillor Smith will be aware, this council does not provide all of the infrastructure needed. So there are other relevant delivery bodies that will do that. The Council then has little control of when these monies are spent. All of the Section 106 legal agreements are available for the public or councillors to view. Thank you. Question 10, Councillor Neil Phillips. Enjoy the wing walk. One of the successful policies that this Council has developed amongst others is the NABSAL programme. At a time when we see cuts to the grant from government and dithering on business rates retention, this programme was forward-thinking as a means to bring additional income into the council, thereby helping to protect other council services. Could the leader of the council please bring the chamber up to date on the NABSEL programme? On an Eaton and Bedworth Community Enterprises Limited, had an income for the council of over £150,000 in 2016-17. The estimated income for this financial year is over 240,000. This income has been generated from a portfolio of 25 properties with two further properties currently being developed as bed and breakfast accommodation, I mean large properties, along with four flats. NABSEL is also exploring opportunities for further business streams outside of the housing field, Mr Mayor. We are being contacted regularly by other authorities is an example of good practice and are happy to show others the way. Uh, question 11. Councillor Condacore, if you'd like to ask your question, please. When the hearing on the local plan on the 31st of March 2017, August, yeah, it's been a long day, um, we had uh, the first evidence-based discussion of housing numbers in this building since the work on the plan, the Borough Plan, began in May 2006. 2006. Right back in November 2011, Oxford Economics produced a report on its Nuneaton and Bedworth forecasting model. Its baseline forecast was that the borough needed 6,240 extra homes over an 18-year period. That is 347 extra homes a year. This was based upon average growth in employment. Instead, the Council's 2013 plan was based on an improbable creation of 12,000 net jobs. That is 12,000 more jobs created than would be lost over the 18-year period. This required building 7,900 homes over 18 years. Over the last four years, this Council and others have kept ratcheting up the housing numbers when the population employment evidence clearly states that the numbers need to actually go down. The latest 
Department of Communities and Local Government forecast for growth in housing numbers was released in August 2016. It shows that DGLC expects us to have 344 more households each year on average, based upon the mid-2014 population estimates. In context, contracts, context, in, um, Coventry is around three times bigger and is currently building around 1,000 units per year, many of which are student flats. The rate of building was expected to rise. However, it seems uncertain with a sharp reduction in net migration, international migration, and a slowing in growth of the two universities. Coventry does have the capacity to build 1,000 homes each year over the length of the plan. In the council's spreadsheet of what could be built each year, the council now sees the council building 1,541 extra homes in the year 2020-21. The borough plan will go into its inevitable next round of consultation. It will go into an inevitable next round of consultation due to the need for major modifications, or may need to be started from scratch as a result of being found unsound. Will the portfolio holder allow us to have a proper, independently chaired investigation into the housing numbers we really need? How does this farce, how bad does this farce have to get before the portfolio, uh, the, the, how bad does it need, this farce need to get before the portfolio holder will admit that this project needs new leadership? Thank you. Bedworth Borough Council falls within the Coventry and Warwickshire housing market area. The Coventry, Warwickshire and Hinckley and Bosworth Joint Committee for Economic Growth and Prosperity are the decision-making body for joint working within the housing market area. The work carried out to inform the examination version of the plan was agreed by the committee. The planning inspector is an independent chair of the examination and that is the forum for alternative considerations to be made at this time. If this council were now to commission their own investigation, it would almost certainly not meet the legal test of duty to cooperate. And our <coughs> final question from members, Councillor Graham. The solicitor hired by the council at the recent borough plan hearings referred to the plan's consultation as a third rate pass. Can the portfolio holder please tell the residents of this borough why he believes a third rate pass is good enough? To this question, and I cannot answer for any comments the barrister may or may not have made. However, the council carried out extensive consultation on the local plan the details of which have been submitted to the planning inspector for his consideration. Just to say, Mr Mayor, it is now with the, the, local, uh, with the planning inspector. It is uh, his plan in effect. OK, thank you for that. It takes us on to item number 10, special urgency decisions. I don't believe there's been any decisions taken under that. Which takes us on to item number 11, is the... Cabinet the report by the leader of the council is, is attached. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think I can't stress enough, time and time again, that this council is being battered, battered by the government, by the, by the Harvey. in particular by the communities department, of which one of our MPs is a minister where our money is yet again being reduced and reduced and reduced. I mentioned the figure the other day, uh, the, earlier on, 1.7 million we have to find uh, in two years. Uh, it is absolutely appalling, Mr Mayor, how we are supposed to manage. We have now got a situation in this council where, up to now, we've managed to weather the storm and keep most of our services intact, unlike many other authorities. Even during the years of Margaret Thatcher, going back that long, Mr Mayor, very, very difficult. We are now in a situation where many officers do the work of what three people used to do, where many of our manual employees are in a similar situation. They have all pulled together in this authority. Everybody has pulled together. Staff, and uh, employees, councillors have pulled together to make sure we provide services to residents. But a gap of over one and a half million pounds, Mr Mayor, is just impossible to bridge. And I'd be very uh, happy to answer questions on this, 
but it's thanks to our hard-working officers that we've managed to get this far without having to make drastic cuts that the next two years are dreadful. That takes us on to item 12, recommendations from Cabinet or other committees. So the uh, 12A, I, I looked around, well he finished and I didn't see anybody indicate. Well it was there for people to indicate, it was, I, I have to assure you I did have a good look around the room and nobody indicated. So if I didn't see you I apologise but we have moved on to the next item, which is item number 12. <laughs> which is item number 12A, it's the Audit and Standards Committee, Councillor Tandy. I move that the Audit and Standards Committee Statement of Accounts 2016-17, that it is being recommended to this Council and I request approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Is that second? Any member? I'll say Councillor Condacore. This is something we can debate on, um, and there's a lot we need to debate about. I actually wanted to bring it up in the last section about the finances of the Council and the medium-term plan. But we have systemic issues in this Council about bad decisions being made in the past, putting us into a bad position. In these accounts, there is obviously some impact of the buying the Woolworths for a million pounds, its lease, and giving TJU's £1.5 million incentive payment to move in. In this year, what we're talking about now, the accounts will show about half a million pounds write down on that investment. So effectively, we made a bad investment all the way back in 2010, and that is now having an effect now, as we find we can only lease the shop out for £1 a year. Clearly, we've made loads and loads of mistakes in the past, and it is not obvious from these accounts where they are, because they're just in revaluations of buildings. But in effect, we made an absolutely stupid error back in 2010 to put £2.6 million into taking over Woolworths, when we knew nothing about running a shop like Woolworths, and we had it based upon a ludicrous business plan. We have the same thing throughout all sorts of issues, the Gresham Road project, etc. These accounts actually just give us top-line numbers, but buried in there is issues like the climbing wall fiasco, where we took about £1,000 revenue from a climbing wall that's supposed to have been paying for itself. These accounts should actually be showing us where we're going and what we should be doing. We should be learning lessons from these accounts, and unfortunately, they're very much a dry record of what's going on at the top level. I am very concerned about the way this council makes decisions, and a lot of the time, we don't find out at the time. We should have found out about the £1 Woolworths rent a lot earlier. We should find out about the Gresham Road overspends a lot earlier. And the things in these accounts which we won't find out about for two or three years to come. But there are serious problems with how this council manages risks and its business approach and its forecasting. Because the other issue is like the car parking charges. We forecast, made a budget, based upon we increase car parking charges, we get more income. That just doesn't happen... And these accounts, yeah, they show a problem. And we, we just rely too much on a whole load of assumptions from people whose assumptions haven't come right. And the particular thing is NABSEL. Marvellous that NABSEL is doing well, but we are buying more and more properties that have a cost. And we can make a capital loss if the housing market collapses. And I think these accounts should show explicitly a nice set of accounts for NABSEL so we can see the liabilities and the risks we're undertaking. I apologise because I don't normally do this. We're discussing the statement of accounts, not the previous report. Thank you. Um, yeah, probably I should have picked up on that, but I was looking at something else at the time. Councillor Wilson. Statement of accounts is, unfortunately, in some respects, just a statement of what was spent or, or in some cases, even lost by the council. And as such, whilst we don't support how the money was spent in vast areas 
by this council. It is a statement of fact as to what things were spent on. I find it interesting, Mr Mayor, that Councillor Harvey, in his prelude to the previous agenda item, said about the battering this council took under Margaret Thatcher. Perhaps it has escaped his notice. He has been in power since the days of Margaret Thatcher and has actually been leading this council three times longer than Margaret Thatcher ever led this country. And we can see the state of Nuneaton and Bedworth as it is now under Wilson. Councillor Harvey's leadership. But looking at page seven of the Statement Sorry. of Accounts, Mr Mayor, I think it is worth highlighting yet again that uh, reduced car parking income, these are the figures, they've been independently audited, £240,000 less against budget. We warned and warned again, time and time again, up and down in this chamber to apparently deaf ears, you put the car parking prices up, you will meet resistance from residents, and lo and behold, it seems to be a mystery to the, op to the controlling party how you lose money when you, put m when you put charges up. And yet this is the mentality we've had since the days of Margaret Thatcher with the party opposite. And then again, trade refuse. We were promised that trade refuse, when it went out to... Um, uh, a dual arrangement with Coventry City Council that we would actually make savings uh, by entering into that arrangement. Yet, with the financial management, again from the uh, days of the 1970s, uh, that we've lost £90,000 on that again. So whilst there is a tale of woe inside the statement of accounts, Mr Mayor, and I hate to have to vote for it, I really do, but I can't vote for some... I have to vote for a statement of fact. It is facts what is contained in here, but the facts seem to be... Get, uh, don't seem to get in the way of a good fantasy story for the uh, controlling group, Mr Mayor. Councillor Harvey. I think you've only to look at what the external auditors say about the way the accounts are run in this council and have been for all the period of its history since uh, 1974 to see that we have always received a good uh, unqualified statement from the auditors. But I would like to correct one fault, Mr Mayor. I have not been the leader of the council since Margaret Thatcher was elected. In fact, I believe Councillor Haynes was the leader of the council at the time. I became the leader of the council in 1986, but I was the leader of the opposition in 2008 when Marcus Jones cut the play scheme and closed toilets in our public park. Councillor Tandy. The Mayor. <coughs> I, like Councillor Harvey, was of the view that this item on the agenda was actually about the... Um, committee decision that was made a couple of weeks ago in relation to the statements of accounts. I need to remind this chamber that the, these accounts have been scrutinised by an external auditor, Grant Thornton, and at the last meeting, with members of the opposition present, they were signed off by their representative and myself as chair of the committee, and they were very congratulatory in the letter that they said about how these accounts had been presented. Thank you, Mr. The uh, recommendation has been moved and seconded. All those in favour? And against? And abstentions? Thank you. That item's carried. If I can take us on then to uh, item number B, Cabinet, Annual Treasury Management Report 2016 and 17. Councillor Harvey. Uh, yes, the, this council's finances have been looked after by our officers and the, work, the sterling work they have done. And the people who criticise have no knowledge of what goes on. And the hard work that goes on by our officers, neither of their knowledge of the sort of uh, qualifications people have who do this work and who unfortunately have to be regularly insulted in this chamber. So I move this before you, Mr Mayor, the, the statement here, and give thanks yet again, not only to the finance officers, but to the officers throughout the council. Uh, I have absolutely wonderful faith in our Treasury management. Craig has, I was on the audit committee, Craig has done an exceptional job in difficult times of changing interest rates, etc. 
In the past, back in 2008, we lost some money under, in Icelandic banks. That era is now over. I have really good faith in the officers working it. But the point is, it's not just a question of having faith. As elected members, we're here to understand what goes on, and I do try to understand what goes on. We're here to have what is going to happen explained to us, and we're here to ask questions, because we are effectively critical friends. We are supposed to be managing this council with the officers to get um, a secure and safe future for our residents. If you look at this report on page 44, it talks about a divested income fund. That is very interesting. It may be very, very good, or it may not. I think we should actually understand better. You, you, you mentioned, Councillor Harvey, we don't understand what's going on. We actually do try to understand what's going on, and I think it would benefit us all to actually have some actually, um, more information about what's going on with this new proposal to invest £2 million ask questions and do it cautiously because we are in an uncertain time. If you actually go over to page 45 at the top, it talks about the changes to regulatory environment and places a greater onus on members to review and scrutinise Treasury management. At the Cabinet last week, which I unfortunately missed because I took a very rare holiday and I was actually OK, Councillor Copeland, I wasn't ill, um, by not being there. It is very, very important that we discuss these things. And this Treasury Management Report flies through the Cabinet in what, about one minute. It flies through Audit Committee in about one minute. If I'm not there, no one asks any questions on anything, it seems. And these are things we should ask questions. Because if we ask questions and we get a good reply, it is actually gives us reassurance. And if we need to be cautious... Yeah, maybe this is a good investment, but maybe we should wait a year till the impact of Brit exit is over. Yeah, we should say that, but we should actually be asking questions. And we should, over Treasury management, be very careful. Ten years ago, I went to the Cabinet, I advised the Cabinet, I sat in that chair and told you not to make the investments and end up losing £3 million in Iceland for a few years. Mr Wilson. We will be voting for this on our side of the chamber. Um, whilst we have our political disagreements across uh, the well of the chamber about how money is spent, I would completely and wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Harvey that the integrity of the officers cannot be impugned. They are always helpful and courteous when you ask questions and want to investigate matters. This report is basically a statement of the operational boundaries and the legal requirements as to how to spend the money. And I cannot see anything political in that. The real politics about the budget comes in February, so I'm happy to vote for this because it is basically we are complying with the law. That is it, Mr Mayor. Councillor Tandy. I didn't see... No, Councillor Jackson reserved the right. She's waving. I was saying, I didn't see anybody. I'm pleased that Councillor Wilson said this because it is, in fact, a, a statement of a fact. There's excellent work done. Councillors do not interfere with decisions about investments. That would be quite wrong. When Councillor Kondaka says that he advised us uh, ten years ago and then we lost three million, well, I will I have to point out again that uh, ten years ago was 2007. There wasn't three million inv in invested in Iceland at the time. There was by 2009, but I was not the council leader at that time. But in actual fact, Mr Mayor, and it sounds as if I might be defending Marcus Jones, he didn't get involved either. And in councils up and down this country of every political description, and I guess Brighton might have been one of them at the time, I think that was green, it, it's da down to the professional advice that was given at the time, and it was seen nationwide that it was safe investment. But people will realise, Mr Mayor, that the collapse of financial institutions and indeed the collapse of Iceland itself as a country, not the only one, but it started around that period, but councillors did not and do not interfere in such matters, Mr Mayor. They are non-political. And seconded, item number B, the annual Treasury Management Report. All those in favour of that? And against? And abstentions? Thank you. That's carried. If we move on to 
Uh, item number C, the General Fund and Housing Revenue Account Quarterly Budget Monitoring Report. Councillor Harvey. Uh, as written here, but in actual fact, it's item two that's the recommendation to Council uh, that the updated General Fund and HRA capital budgets as attached be approved. Okay, thank you. Any member? <coughs> Councillor Tromans. I think for the benefit of, uh, of everyone here, I uh, should uh, correct something that gets said pretty much every year when we, we get to this stage uh, in the council year of looking back at the, the audited accounts. Uh, and the auditors do seem to do a very good job. But what they don't do is, is something that seems to be alluded to every year. And this year it was uh, the leader and councillor Tandy again seem to imply that Grant Thornton, the auditors, are in some way endorsing the, the policies or the spending or the or those arrangements of the accounts. They're not. They're saying that the accounts have been properly and legally prepared. They are not making uh, an endorsement of the policy decisions and what the money has been spent on. And I think that's an important distinction to make, uh, Mr Mayor. If I can refer you to page 63 of the report, there's a very informative uh, chart there, uh, which, you know, again, as in previous years, we, we see the Civic Hall losing us yet more money again, still no appetite to turn that business around. You know, I commend the council for hoping that NABSEL can generate some money, but its track record in, in running businesses and doing well and whatever isn't great, uh, and that concerns me. Uh, but we only have to look down again at that commercial property rents. That's already lost over a quarter of a million in the last quarter. And we look down still further, lost over 65,000 on parking again uh, in this last quarter. So that will be another quarter of a million or so over the year. You know, we've heard about the Gresham Road, the 1.8 million there, the climbing wall, all these m sums that add up to several million. And I hear Councillor Harvey talking about, oh, you know, we've got to find a million of savings. It, it's so tough for us. Well, here's a suggestion. If you weren't losing millions of pounds with all these bad decisions historically and all these bad decisions currently, wouldn't be so difficult, wouldn't be in that situation. In fact, c can I make a suggestion? You know, it's carried on losing us money, the car, car parking charges hike. It's continuing. It lost a quarter of a million to start with. It's going to lose another quarter of a million this year unless you put your hands up and say, you know what, we're going to think again. We're going to cut the parking charges. We're actually going to get more revenue because more people will come in. It will increase the footfall. It will do something to benefit and regenerate our town centre. It will increase the economy, and that's what we want. We want, and this, this side of the council chamber has been calling consistently for investment and regeneration in our town centre. While it seems that the leading group that have been around for a very long time don't seem to care about the decline of the town centre, you know, fell out with the co-op who were supposed to be their friends. We've watched business after business go, and it's just continued decline. So we are urging the Business Improvement District that will sort that out, that will correct some of these numbers, Mr Mayor, that will improve them so that next year we're not looking at such a bleak picture. We also think there needs to be investment and regen in, to regenerate the town centre but it's quite clear from all the catastrophes that we've heard about tonight, from the losses here, it can't be this council that manages that. It can't be the political leadership. If there is to be major investment and regeneration in the town centre, we need to get proper experts in to do it so that next year and in future years, the figures aren't so bleak. Thank you. I will heartily echo what Councillor Tromans has just said because time and time again I stand at this position and highlight the issues, particularly with car parking, the town centres, the regeneration, and time and time again the controlling group seem to ignore all sense of reason and rhyme, indeed experts who have actually sat in that gallery and offered them free consultation advice, gratis to this council, but yet this council and particularly the leadership seems to think it knows better than those who are qualified and actually in the business. It's interesting that on page 70, when it refers to the General Fund Capital Programme, that there is still £150,000 left in the Town Centre Regeneration Pot, which we did actually welcome. We wholeheartedly supported you putting that money in to do that after years of calling for more money to help with the regeneration of the town centres. Only £50,000 of that has been spent in 12 months. And there are many things which could help the town centres 
uh, with in in encouraging shoppers and market traders and businesses to open up into our town centres. So it seems like the council are using the £150,000 as a fig leaf to say, hey, we're doing something, we've got this £150,000 there, but it's not doing anything if it's just sat there and not being spent to the benefit of the businesses, residents, shoppers and traders of this borough. Now, I'm going to reiterate what Councillor Troman said because perhaps one time eventually the controlling group will listen. And as I said in the previous agenda item, we lost a quarter of a million pounds on car parking income. If you look, and the figures are there for everyone to see, it's in black and white, almost £64,000 that we're down on car parking income already in the first three months of this financial year. Three months we are down £64,000. If you follow the current trajectory and the pattern was emerging the same time last year, we stood here at the same time last year and said we are 60 odd thousand pounds down on the car parking metered income. I stood here and said that on that trajectory we'll be losing a quarter of a million pounds. And standing here at the end of the financial year, what do the figures reveal? We're down a quarter of a million pounds. And I don't want to be stood here in the same position saying yet again, we're down a quarter of a million pounds. When will the controlling group listen, Mr Mayor? They seem to pride themselves on being an open and transparent council, although I think one or two residents in the gallery would dispute the transparency of this council. But if you are really in listening mode, you will look at the figures, you will take the advice from people who come and offer it, and actually do something about it. The same old answers lead to the same old problems, and they aren't resolving them, Mr Mayor, so we won't vote for this report. Councillor... Yeah, I've got it. Councillor Condico. Lots of interesting stuff in this report, and I actually sort of disagree that the um, leadership doesn't listen, because actually we've been on it for years and years that we needed a town centre manager back, and they finally put one back. It was a massive loss four years, and actually looking at the market store income, which is starting to, the fall starting to slow down, actually maybe you did listen eventually that we needed to get some money into the town centre, and actually maybe if we push that through we can actually start thinking about regenerating our town, actually having sensible car parking charges rather than this blanket rates that mean we've got empty car parks. And actually, we can actually try and be optimistic. Yeah, we should actually look and stop this looking backwards and try and look forwards. We can actually make this town more successful. It took Hinkley a long while to do it. It set the Business Improvement District up. It had to work business. It had to be constructive. But Hinkley has come a lot better and gone a long way. And I don't think it had been particularly party political over Hinkley Way. They, lots of different parties have run the Hinkley Council, but there are people who actually talk to businesses and listen to them. On the other issues, waste is a really big cost in here. We talk about recycling credits in here. We should really be working together as a county, and in fact probably Coventry and Warwickshire on waste. We waste so much money with bin lorries driving past each other. And the issues over shortage of crews, Coventry's just going through the pain of changing over to a system like we changed over to about five or six years ago. Yeah, these are areas where we could actually be really saving money if we actually worked with Coventry and Warwickshire and actually having this, the same bin service, the same staff, but actually working together as a collection service so we actually get efficiencies of scale maintenance etc there's a whole load of things we could do better and rather than be negative i might be positive for change yeah the, the town centre manager has actually been a good um, hire we are starting to tidy things up do deep cleans and maybe we can actually start to move forward and actually make this town a great success like it was in 2008-9 when we won best market street market of the year award Thank you. um okay town Councillor Goldby. Thank you. Some more information from uh, Councillor Condacore. Hinkley only have one Labour councillor. Uh, that might have something to do with it. Um, I'm looking at this and I can see town centre improvements and town centre regeneration schemes on two separate lines, one for 200,000 and one for 150,000. It doesn't really explain what that's about or what the differentiation is between the two. Um, I'm hoping that one of them uh, will be used to listen to us again and put a nice Christmas tree in the town centres because you listened to us last year and it was much appreciated by the residents. Um, 
it was in the budget. Uh, if, if you want to check back, you can. It's, it's minuted. Um, uh, the other thing was I'm seeing the Bermuda Connectivity Project, so I'm guessing that you've still not pulled your support for it, uh, even though you keep saying it's not your fault, it's somebody else's, but I'm, I'm yet to see anybody stand up from, from here and actually support the residents and say, stop the project. So I can't vote for it because the, the Connectivity Project is still in there. Thanks. My hobby horse, or I'm rather particular,